Welcome to the 15th episode of Season 4 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Tuesday the 13th of September 2011, and in this episode we're going to talk to Jonathan Nadu about accessibility, Sarah Shard and Tony Sales about their schools project. We will of course cover the latest news events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and go over your feedback. I'm name <laughs> with me this week I'm, I'm alan and with me this week is tony hello laura hello and mark hiya <laughs> there we are that's just confusing uh tony how are you what have you been up to uh, i'm not too bad thank you i've uh, i became an ubuntu member really? oh yes, you did well you? Yeah. Yeah. last week oh, it, i nearly forgot <laughs> i thought we could eke it out over a series of um, episodes to describe the uh, tortuous process but actually it was all over and done in about a fortnight <laughs> um, it's not torturous is it no it's not that was the point i was yeah. expecting it to be a lot harder than it was but clearly it's all... basically edit a wiki page yeah and then turn up to a meeting uh, yes uh, of course you have to have been the host of a popular podcast for four years for the you have end. to have done yeah. that <laughs> well as somebody who's not a, a developer and who files relatively few bugs um it was all based on my uh, contributions in other realms such mm. as the podcast and things i do mm. um but yeah it was it was a pretty painless process really and had some nice comments and supportive statements yeah what does it mean now you remember it means I can get an Ubuntu.com email address uh, and uh, I get all sorts of badges on my Launchpad profile page <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on Planet Ubuntu now. So, Oh, yeah, golly, yeah, yes. Yeah, so you can you uh, get, yeah, okay. use that. <laughs> I can <can't laughs> really yes. pimp your stuff Pimped on my wares. On Don't you get like a clock of invisibility or something? <laughs> yeah. On you get a Linux Weekly oh. News subscription if that's oh, yeah. much the same. Yes, that's good as well, which mm. is you know something you'd have to pay money for otherwise. Mm. But mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. Cool. cool. Laura? How about yourself? What have you been up to? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, I went to a Women in IT event on Wednesday. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, what was that all about? It was It was at work. It was Without interesting. Without wishing to be rude. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, some of it was really, really interesting in that some of our senior technical women in the lab um, talking about, well, one of them, they were talk, she was talking about her career. And it was really nice because um, she did the same thing as Lorna Jane did at Old camp where she didn't just make herself sound amazing. She sort of talked about the bits where she found it more difficult or where things hadn't gone quite right and stuff, which was really good because it makes you feel like, oh, not a superwoman. So. Right, overcoming adversity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Man. So, uh, yeah, that was good. And there was some was slightly more annoying thing. thing, or, or, thing. Or, um, or yeah. a public thing? It was an internal thing, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that was interesting. Excellent. Mark, how about yourself? Um, I've been listening to sci-fi audiobooks because I realised... Geek! <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Ubuntu UK podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really quite terrible at reading books, but I really enjoy them, so I figured audiobooks were an easy way to get the best of both worlds. Mm. And where have you been buying them from? Uh, the Ubuntu uh, One Music Store? Uh, Audible Cough. <gasps> uh, because it was the best value in the best range that's basically amazon and, isn't it yes it is owned by amazon yeah. and they play on my android phone which is what i listen to everything on so oh. that was that, that was basically my main criteria so at the moment i'm listening to june which is 21 hours long and very good yeah <laughs> i prefer terry myself where uh, thank ignoring you. that uh where, where when do you get the opportunity to listen to uh, audiobooks then you have to like pay a lot of attention you can't uh, do it while you're coding, when my girlfriend's what? watching csi mainly ah there's okay. a lot of CSI. Yeah, there's a lot of CSI. There is. I once set my PVR. I set it to record all C- all CSI, and within a couple of days, it was full. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oops. So, Alan, you bailed on us for the last episode. Yes, I was on holiday. Okay, so that means you've done nothing whatsoever. Uh, I I discovered some very nice pubs in Devon. Okay, uh, which was nice, uh, and I also discovered that the place we are. Ah, I tell you what, I I did discover is. Don't get my mother-in-law to book the holiday venue because she doesn't take into account the three G coverage. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, How there was no she? no three G while we we're on holiday, but okay. there was but there was a hot tub, so that more than made up for it. <laughs> okay. I did see some t- messages from you where you were standing in the corner of the field with your phone up and yes. in the air trying to get a signal. <laughs> Actually, I had uh, my laptop standing on a gatepost with a three G dongle hanging out of it. And right. uh, I had a torch, and while I'm standing there, I was very grateful that I've got an illuminated keyboard on my on my laptop. And um, every so often, I'd hear these little noises at the middle of the night, and um, yeah, it was quite scary. So I shut my laptop and went back to the house. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit extreme. 
Yes. <laughs> the going out in the dark bit in the first place. I, I, I only went online to download the last episode of the podcast that you guys did when Aww. I wasn't there. So I could listen to it in bed on holiday. That's Alan's excuse for being caught worrying sheep, I think. <laughs> downloading a podcast officer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, as yes. penance for that, well, well, we talked to Sarah and Tony from uh, Hereford Lug. Um, I'll go make the tea, I think. Okay. All right. You get on with that then. Okay, uh, we're here with Tony Sales and Sarah Chard from Herefordshire Lug. Hello, guys. Hi. Hello. 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 Um, and um, you're going to talk about the uh, Open Source Schools project, which you're launching as part of Software Freedom Day. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Brilliant. So do you want to start by telling us uh, just a bit about what the Open Source Schools project is? Okay. Well, basically, the, the Herefordshire Lug decided that for Software Freedom Day this year, they wanted to do something with a focus on education. And we had a little think about it and decided the best thing we could do was actually try to approach schools and get them to look at some open source software. And we started off with quite a small idea and then it rather expanded because Tony decided that uh, he would like to have a go at developing uh, an operating system that would work for schools which he did uh, with Tux Edu, and we're now at the point where we're going to go into schools and demonstrate Tux Edu and the open source software on it to teachers and children and parents, and hopefully um, get them to use a lot more open source software. So what's in Tux Edu? Well, uh, can I just talk about first why I felt the need to create Tux Edu? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Your pronunciation there. <laughs> Tux Edu, like Tuxedo, rather than Tux Edu. Uh, the reason I developed it is because there, even though there are a few distros out there aimed at primary school children, there's Doodoo Linux, there's the uh, Sugar on a Stick project, and there's Edubuntu, uh, they didn't give us enough control over the actual programs which are uh, contained, or okay. the interface, or the size or security of the disk. And what, what I found with those uh, distros is they're very generic, and they're probably useful for children all over the world but they don't specifically meet the needs of the English national curriculum mm. and the syllabus. Mm -hmm. By making our own version, we can actually target elements of the national curriculum which schools have to, by law, uh, meet, and therefore that gives us a little niche. We have programmes and uh, uh, combinations of stuff which other distros wouldn't have, and we can obviously tweak that so it's just right for the schools. So are you specifically targeting it to the UK curriculum? Initially, yes, because... The, the curriculums across the world are very, very different. And the fact is, if teachers don't have to do something, if it doesn't say somewhere on a form, you have to do this, it's very unlikely they're going to do it. Mm. So by targeting initially the, the British national curriculum, that's our starting point. If other people think this is suitable, they, could, they want, would want to modify a version for their own educational system. So what specific uh, alterations have you been able to get into it to tailor it to the UK curriculum? Well, we've been talking to some of the uh, educational authorities locally. Mark Sanderson, I think, is the guy who's in charge of, of primary education in Herefordshire. And he's identified a few areas where they've had difficulty finding suitable software for the children to use. So one of them has been finding a suitable animation package that can do stop-motion animation. Okay. And one has been uh, finding a suitable programming uh, language for them. And what we haven't solved yet is a, is a suitable database application we're trying to put in the applications he thinks there's a need for in the schools, which isn't currently being met by their existing software. Right. So when you were looking at this, you know, the scope of the things you were looking for, were you really just looking at um, Linux-based open source applications, or did you consider the open source uh, version of applications to run on Windows as well? Uh, in this particular project, I've been focusing on uh, Linux-based uh, applications and distributions but I think Sarah you could explain about the open source software disk which we've been pushing as well. Yes for the past few years for Software Freedom Day what the HLUG has done is have a disk that has open source so software that runs under Windows and we give that away and it's a specific disk that we've created of software that 
we felt was useful for um, teachers, for businesses, just for general users. And we give that away at the events that we run on Software Freedom Day and on Document Freedom Day when we run an event as well. But for this schools project, we wanted to do something a lot more specific that we felt teachers would really feel was aimed at them. And the other thing that we've done is produce two different versions of Tuxedu, which means that one version is locked so that children can take it home with them, run it on computers at home without any fear of um, them getting onto the internet or okay. um, accessing any programs on the computer and causing problems on the computer. And that's what Tony meant before about the security of the disk. I didn't quite catch that, sorry. Sorry, uh, earlier you said about the security of the disk was one thing you wanted yeah, to control. Well, as Sarah said, we've done two versions. One of them is completely locked down, which means you can't access the hard drive, uh, you can't access the internet. All you can do is use the programs which are provided on the disk uh, and turn the computer off again. So there's no way a child could, for example, accidentally access things either on the local hard drive or on the internet. They can't install it, for example. Uh, the other version we've got is actually a fully installable version, and that one, of course, can be installed and they can go on the internet. But initially, we'll be giving out a secure version because we can be confident a teacher or a child can use it, and they don't have to have any fear about what they're doing. They're not going to mess up the computer they're using. They're not going to get access to the internet. Right. So the 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 full version. Are you when you're giving that away? Are you designing? Is is it designed to be run as a live CD initially, or is it designed yes, it is. just I mean, to be installed permanently? The installable version is based on Ubuntu, which is the LXD right. desktop version of Ubuntu, and uh, that is it's basically the basic Ubuntu package, but with our desktop set up and our programs added on top of it. Yeah. Just under one gig in size. It won It runs perfectly happily as a as a live CD. But, of course, with that one, you can install it. It has all of the packages in, like a web browser, wireless drivers and stuff like that. The secure version we've built, I did originally try to build it on Ubuntu. And one of the problems I had was Ubuntu now makes things so easy for everybody. It was actually quite difficult to completely lock it down and stop people getting access to the Internet and loading drivers and things like that. Uh, so I'd, I've actually I built the secure version using Debian LXDE. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why did you choose schools and educational rather than, say, businesses or uh, third age sector, anything like that? Well, I think there's two reasons. One of them is that I'm a teacher myself, so I work in education, even though I work with older children. Uh, but the main reason is we're constantly trying to get businesses or university students to use open source software, and there's a lot of resistance because basically they've been brainwashed by Microsoft or Mac, and that's the only they expect everything to work with Windows. So my idea is <clears throat> if we want to convert people to open source software, we have to start with young people, get them familiar with it, or at least so they know it exists, and then as they grow up, they'll be much more open to using it. So... Um in terms of actually getting it into the schools, have you found that that sort of the fact that people are already so used to the status quo of Microsoft and Apple that it's actually hard for you to make any headway with this in the schools? Or have you found that it's actually been and um, there's actually been quite a lot of um, acceptance and interest in it? Well, we had to begin with thought that we would have a lot of resistance. But what we found was that because we had a bit of a track record with the council and particularly talking to the education department within the council about other events that we'd run, and so we had a basic relationship with them of saying, we're putting on Software Freedom Day, please send this information out to teachers. They had already heard about us. Oh, cool. So when we approached them with this idea of running an open source schools project, they were quite open to it and actually have proved to be very, very helpful. And having the support of the um, ICT guys at the council and also of the um, technicians in the companies that run the school networks has been extremely useful to us. And if anyone else was running a similar project, I would definitely say approach your local council and get them on side because it's very important for actually getting into the schools because teachers are so busy and they have so much information coming through to them every day from all kinds of sources that unless you have some kind of official backing, you're going to find it quite hard to get into the school. 
Have you had much contact with the parents? Not as yet, but we've only, we're only just literally starting the project. It launches on Software Freedom Day, and uh, we are hoping to run not only workshops in the schools for the children and the teachers, but we're also hoping to actually arrange some evenings when we can get parents in to talk to them about particularly the lockdown CDs that we're going to be giving to the children. So how involved is the lug in general, Herefordshire lug in general, with this project and these efforts? Are there lots of you able to maintain and help develop this distro or, or is it just a small group of you? There's a core group of us who do most of the work, but we are um, we're pretty active and we're quite committed to it. So we are lucky that we have such active uh, and willing volunteers, really. And are they uh, developers or system administrators or are there people helping with documentation? We've completely uh, uh, mixed skills. There are some of us who are um, like Tony who can, who can develop and who are at ease with that side of it. And then there are others who are good at the documentation side and others who have already had experience in, of working in schools or in the education sector. So we are very much a cross-section. Cool. Um, you mentioned earlier some of the, the needs which you were trying to write Tux Edu to, sorry, Tux Edu to, um, to fulfil. Um, what, so what applications have you actually got on there which are there to meet those needs? Well, initially, when I first picked uh, applications, I just threw everything on I could find which seemed appropriate for the age group. Mm -hmm. And then we did a bit of testing amongst ourselves and got feedback. It was also a question of size on the disk. So I started off with things like Child's Play, uh, G-Compress, yeah. and PySci Cache. Now, they're three, if you like, suites of applications mm. which contain lots of mini games within them. So I started off with those because for, for very young children, reception age, year one and two, they're ideal for getting people to use the mouse, to use the keyboard. They've got simple word games, uh, simple games with sounds, matching patterns and things like that. So I started off that as a base. I then added the three famous Tux programs, which is Tux Math, uh, Tux Typing, and the third one, which is Tux Paint. So that mm -hmm. covers numeracy, literacy, and uh, graphics. Which uh, so they're three excellent programs. Uh, the other, the other main programs I've added in. There's a few interesting ones like Numpty Physics, which I think is a great, uh, a great little program. <laughs> yeah, I've been playing that recently. Ones. It's basically you have to draw things. Uh, freehand with the mouse and then the laws of physics take control and the objects you've created will fall to the earth or roll around yeah it's brilliant uh, and i've also i am stuck on level 10 though so if you know a way around that please let me know. <laughs> uh, the other side of that is that i've also installed quite a lot of the uh, the kde educational application mm -hmm. like k geography uh i think there's k typing all of the ones that start with a k basically <laughs> they're actually quite even though i'm not particularly fond of the kde desktop those applications are quite well written and there's a lot of documentation for mm. them. So we've given a, a good selection of educational programs from ages about 2 till 10. Obviously, we will be making a DVD version and we may be making some in script, scripts that allow people to install uh, more packages afterwards. And that's, that'll be the next stage after our initial pilot study is to start expanding the programs we uh, include based on what teachers and children say to us rather than saying, this is what we're going to give you started off with a basic selection, they can then tell us what they want more of or what they want less of. Cool. There's obviously a lot of work that goes into managing a distro. Are you able to look at getting a commercial footing for this so that you could do it as, a, as an ongoing business, perhaps either through sponsorship or pre-installed applications, something like that? Well, I think at this stage that's, that's very uh, premature to talk about that. I mean, at the, at the moment, I'm making the distro myself, uh, which I've spent most of the, well, most of the summer holidays doing it in my spare time. Uh, and I've done the same for Vinex now for three years. Uh, I think once you start talking about money and making a profit or earning a living out of it, the whole nature of the enterprise changes. And for me, one of the important points is this is a community effort, mm -hmm. not doing it for personal gain. And I think that, in a, in a way, this, the project then stays pure in that sense. And I think between us, there's probably half a dozen of us who will be able to help with lots of parts of, of the, uh, with the distribution manufacturing process and that's probably enough for us to do it. Excellent. So where can people find out more if they would like to get involved? Well, I think the first place to start would be the Tuxedo website. It's very simple. There's basically one page at the moment and a link to the downloads page, and that, they can find that at http colon forward slash forward slash 
tuxedo.org.uk. Tuxedo is spelled T U X E D U E D U. Cool. cool. We'll put a link in the show notes so that they can um, make sure they find it. And obviously, they can find out about Software Freedom Day on the Herefordshire Lug yeah. at herefordshire.lug.org.uk. Brilliant. Okay, right. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks very much. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks. It's time for a command line love, and this time one has been sent in by somebody called Alan Pope. Yes. And he's going to read it all out to us in its entirety now. No, I'm not. Good. It's very long. <laughs> it's probably the longest one we've had so far, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what does it do? Um, so I was bored one day, and I thought, I wonder if I can get a, um, a, a random package from the repository and find you know something that I've never seen before, some application that I've, I've never tried, because people tell me there's thousands of packages in the repository. Yep. Um, and there's loads that obviously I've never seen. Um, and I thought, well, I don't want to just look at random packages because I might find libraries or... I was going to say lots of lib pango dev 2.3. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want anything that starts with lib and I don't, think any, I don't want anything that ends in dev, probably. Okay. So I constructed this rather shonky uh, command line and all it does is grep through um, the package list that you already have on your machine, on your Ubuntu machine, uh-huh. and cuts out a few of the things that you don't want and then shuffles it and randomly picks one. And it does an apt cache show to show you the details about the package. So you get the short description and what it depends on. So you can see, oh, God, that depends on a bazillion other packages. So I won't install that or um, just read the description and decide whether you want to play with it or not. And what delights have you discovered using this fantastic thing? Yeah, not much. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I did find myself like running it repeatedly. I I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll install one randomly and then force myself to play with that and, you know, learn about this new package or maybe file a bug if it doesn't work the way I expected to. Right. And I found myself going up arrow, press enter, seeing something and going, oh, no, I don't want that. And then up arrow, no, no. (laughs) I found myself being a lot more selective than I thought I would be. Is it like playing the chance game in Argos? I don't know what the chance game in Argos is. Uh, Tony plays this. This is where you what? write down any number and go and buy it. Yeah, well, you, you go, tap go into Argos, the... tap it into the machine. If it's got, in, if it's in stock, you know you've got you've to go got and to buy, buy that it. item. <laughs> He's randomly into it. He's never yet hit a real okay. number. No, fortunately. So I tweeted this, and someone suggested um, you could do, you know, some kind of Russian roulette by um, a good Russian roulette where you install the package without actually reading the documentation, change from apt cache show <laughs> to just apt get install, whatever random package it comes up with. And I thought, yeah, that might be quite fun. And then someone else came up with a uh, Russian roulette, removing yeah. random packages. <laughs> the, the real put, Russian roulette. Put one it? package where the installer just runs RMRF slash. <laughs> oh, oh, no, oh, I wouldn't do that. No. Yeah. <laughs> and that's command line hate. That's another segment, <laughs> segment we're thinking of. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that was it, really. That's the cool. end of the command line love, then. So, last episode, someone suggested that we have an accessibility expert on to talk about some of the issues that developers should keep in mind when they're developing applications to be accessible. Um, Jonathan Nadal volunteered to talk to us as he's experienced of both free software and in using free software accessibility. And Jonathan's on the line now. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's an honor, honor to be on the show. Oh, that oh. satellite delay there causes a bit of a <laughs> panic thinking you weren't there. <laughs> oh, dear. Hi. Uh, um, so, yes, uh, you've been doing stuff with uh, GNOME, I think, uh, just generally in Linux and accessibility. And I was wondering how long you've actually been using free software and free software with accessibility. Uh, it's, going, it's going on about four years now. Okay. How did you get started? Well, I was uh, using a proprietary operating system with proprietary screen reader, and I heard about Ubuntu maybe like in 05 or so, but I didn't actually visit it until around uh, 07 when uh, Gutsy Given came out. I went to the Ubuntu... Uh, website and I was reading about it and it said I had a built-in screen reader and I thought that was fascinating so 
I downloaded it, and uh, everything worked right out of the box the minute I downloaded it, and yeah. I started using the Orca screen reader. And from that on, I started learning about free software, and uh, the whole idea of it fascinated me. And from there on out, I have completely stopped using any proprietary software and only use free software now. So before you used Ubuntu, you were using proprietary software. Were you, were you using uh, similar kind of screen readers and tools on, on I guess, Windows? Uh, Windows doesn't really have a screen reader. But they claim that there is one, but they should be com- really ashamed of what it is, and they shouldn't even call it a screen reader. Um, oh. It's unfortunate that Windows leaves room for these other companies to come in and make proprietary solutions because... For someone to get a screen reader that actually works on their computer running Windows, you're looking at basically anywhere from nine hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for whoa, whoa. one license. <sighs> wow! And yeah, oh my god, that's unbelievable. And uh, so obviously, it's very attractive to have um, an operating system that comes with this stuff out of the box. Uh, obviously, this is very expensive software on Windows. How does it really compare? Is it? Is the stuff on, on Ubuntu any good, you know, for someone who actually uses this stuff? Well, I, I would have to say at first, with Gutsy Given, it was, you could use it, but, it, you know, there was definitely a difference between, you know, the proprietary solution and, and Orca at that time, the screen reader is Orca. There's definitely a difference at that time, but now it's, it's quite comparable. There's maybe a slight difference, but for me, it, it, you know, I can do everything I need to do with the free solution. Could you um, explain briefly what a screen reader is for people who haven't come across them before and what it's like to use one? Sure. Uh, Orca is very tied into the GNOME desktop, so um, almost any distribution running GNOME, uh, you can start Orca. A large majority have Orca installed by default. So to start it, you would just hit the Alt-F2 to bring up the run box. You would type in Orca, and Orca would start. And then you would just go through a quick setup process. It might take like a minute and you would log out and log back in, and you'd have a screen reader. So what I would do on a, a GNOME desktop, I would hit Alt-F1, and that would bring me to the menu where places and system and the applications part of the menu is, and I can arrow through that and you know select what I'm looking for. If I want to go into the home folder, I can click on that and browse through the home folder. If I want to write a document, I can open up you know LibreOffice or OpenOffice at the time and type out the document. Um, or you can, instead of going to the menu again, you can open up that run box with all the F2 and just type in the name of the program and hit enter, and it'll just open the program from there. And it just reads out any text that it comes across? Yeah, I, I, I prefer doing it that way. It's just, you know, so much quicker just to type it in than to have to maneuver through the menu by arrow, arrow, you know, down, down, right, down. It's just a lot quicker to start it from the text. Okay, what sort of... Um things make a screen reader experience work well and work badly in terms of software? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, When you're using a screen reader, are there things about software that can make it very irritating or difficult to use? As far as accessibility, I know the GNOME has like the on-screen keyboard. Um, There's also magnification, which is built into Orca, but I know quite a few low-vision users that actually use the Compiz instead because the magnification on that is, uh, I wouldn't say considerably better, but it's a little more flexible than the, the magnification built into Orca. Um, I know there are some text-to-speech engines, but those are uh, being worked on currently, and uh, they're quite hard to uh, actually get implemented. It takes quite a long time for that to really like get working like the dragon naturally naturally speaking that takes a long time for stuff like that to work so that's still in the works and hopefully that's it's coming along and i understand you you run your own business doing uh selling systems is that right yeah well i was doing that i, I stopped uh, not like shortly ago I, I stopped doing that but i was building uh computers with um ubuntu pre-installed on them and, and, and i was calling them blind optimized where i would get the machine ready for a blind user to use out of the box. And is that, is that difficult for, for you to do? Because obviously, um, from my perspective, I, I stick a CD in and, and, you know, boot the thing up and go through the installer. And you're installing clean on new systems for someone else. Are there, are there problems actually going through the installer before you even get to the desktop? Yeah, well, yeah, that, 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 that is kind of part of the, the, the hurdle to get over. So 
what I would do is my wife would help me install it, and once it was installed, I would just go in and set everything up, get set up work and everything. So that way, when the blind user bought the computer, all they would have to do is turn it on, and or you know the computer would boot up, talking right away, and then be able to use the computer right out of the box. Right. So you do quite a bit of work. Uh, I think is it promoting accessibility in open source, or do you actually get involved with developing? Uh, I don't do any developing. I'm, I'm, I call myself a, a free software advocate of accessibility and free software. I'm, I've been doing whatever I can to be involved in various communities to help out accessibility and get involved and report bugs. And uh, I've done, um, like, the latest project I actually worked on with uh, Ruben Rodriguez from the Triskel distribution. And mm-hmm. hopefully he'll be pushing this change to Ubuntu, which would be great. Um, I was working with him. And he worked with the Ubiquity installer. And what we managed to do is if a person takes a live CD and drops it in the, into their tray and they boot off of it, if you do not touch it when it goes to the first menu where you would pick your language and stuff, if you let it sit there for 30 seconds, the um, installer will automatically boot into a live session with the Orca screen reader running by default. Mm-hmm. So what's great is a, a blind person and a sighted person could benefit from this because... Mm-hmm. When you guys put in the disk, you'll see the, the the language menu, and you'll just click on it. And the minute you do that, you'll you won't even realize that it has an accessible installer. But if a blind person puts it in, they'll just let the CD sit there, and it will go through. It'll skip through the picking your language and boot right into a live session with the worker screen reader running, and then they can install it on their own without any sighted help at all. And once you once you've um, set one of these systems up for someone. Is there like a prescribed set of applications that are, you know, like you say, blind optimized, or or is it basically any GNOME application um, should just work okay because Orca's built for GNOME? Well, you have the best chance of uh, out of the box, like anything written in GTK, you have a much better chance at kind of working out of the box because Orca works really well with GTK. Uh, right now, anything written in Qt at this at this moment isn't really accessible, but the, the QT framework is being worked on. And I think when they release the, the version 5, and there's also another uh, piece of program being worked on called the, the Accessibility Protocol, I, I don't know, it's like four or five uh, ac- long letter acronym, but it's basically <laughs> like an accessibility layer, and they're making a QT version of that, which once that's implemented, Orca will then be able to see uh, applications written in QT and as long as the proper protocol has been follow, followed with writing the applications, then those should become accessible also. So I guess one of the, the big issues for a lot of people, if you're looking mostly at GTK apps as working well and Qt not so good on, on, on GNOME, would be uh, apps like Skype, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, they, like Skype, Skype will work because there's actually a Pigeon plugin for Skype. Oh, so yeah. So if you wanted to use it, yeah, you can, it, it, tie, it ties into Skype, so you can see, like, all your contacts, and you can make calls, and you can chat and everything with the, uh, with the pitch and plug-in for Skype, so that, that works. But, so, that, you know, if you look hard enough, there's always a way around something, you know. I mean, most, most applications really, when you're using the GUI, I mean, there's really commands going on in the background from the command line. So if you know a lot of the switches that you need to type in from the command line, you could probably use most programs from the command line anyways if you are that determined to use a particular program. How do um, open source applications fare on the web in terms of, say, using a site that's based on Drupal or WordPress? Do you find that they're, well, how easy are they to use compared to other sort of maybe just odd websites or websites based on other proprietary CMS systems and things like that? Uh, it, works pretty, it works really well. I haven't really run into a WordPress site or a Drupal site yet that I haven't really been able to access You know everything on the screen. Um, I mean, I've even built a handful of WordPress and Drupal sites myself, and I can even uh, manage the you know the admin page for all of those, and I can see everything even on those to create pages and put in text and write blog posts and stuff. So both of those frameworks are extremely accessible from what I can tell. Cool. We've had a question from Anton in the Hash Ubuntu-UK-podcast IRC channel asking if there's an introduction to getting started anywhere. He'd like to um, try some uh, screen readers and things with uh, one of his colleagues at work. Uh, well, there's one project I would I would look at, uh, which would be uh, Vinix, which is an Ubuntu-based distro, which, but it's 
specifically built for uh, blind and visual user, uh, visually impaired users. And I think the website is vinix projectorg And if you go there and you download um, any of the distros, really, but the latest is 3.2, which is based off of Natty. And if they downloaded that and burned the ISO, and then if they put the disk in, it will just automatically boot into a live session with the Orca screen reader running. And they could either, you know, try out the desktop from the live session, or they could even go to the installer and install it themselves. You know, a blind person, again, could install themselves without any sighted help. Oh, what, what, have they made changes to the installer then, or done, done some work to make the installer more easy so they don't have to, you know, get their sighted partner or a friend to help them do the install? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure what Phoenix did. I know I've looked, they have build scripts that you can look at, and I believe what Vinix does is uh, Tony Sales, the project leader, what he'll do is he'll install, the, he's, he's sighted, and he'll install the distro with the accessible installer that's built into Ubuntu. And after he installs it, he installs it. He then uses his build scripts and remasters this and basically creates a new ISO image of installing the distro with the accessible installer. And when he does that, when he creates the new ISO, it automatically boots into the live session with uh, the Orca screen reader running, which right. is slightly different than what I was saying that Ruben Rodriguez did from Triscale. He actually changed some of the code in the Ubiquity installer. I think he, he did it in about 20 lines where, again, like I said, if you just let it sit at the first screen, right. and mm. then it just automatically boots into the Orca screen reader. Awesome. So uh, Vinix, just to confirm, is V-I-N-U-X. Is that correct? Uh, V-I-N-U-X. Yeah, actually, we spoke to Tony Sales earlier in the program. <laughs> we were interviewing them yeah, about another yeah. subject. Um, yeah, yeah, Tony's great. Guy. I've spoken with him quite a bit. Ah, oh, cool. We're doing quite well on these matching up of interview thing going on. <laughs> um, another quick question um, from Super NGR in the IRC channel, um, asking how a visually impaired uh, installer setup screen would allow the user to choose their language. If it sets up a screen reader um, automatically, can they actually then choose different languages as well? Well, I, I know with uh, both Tony's Vinix and the Entrascal, they'll get a when they boot into the live session, it's automatically in English. But when you click on the installer, you can the first thing, the first option is to change the language. And I know on Triscale, if you do change the language, the Orca screen reader will change to that language. I'm mm. not sure about Vinix. I, I obviously haven't had a need to do that, but Ruben speaks Spanish and he tested it out and it does work on Triscale. It's worth pointing out that there's a new project in um, Ubuntu to uh, for each uh, loco team to create a customized um, ISO image and the idea is that it boots into your default language by default so you could take a customized okay. version of that right. and uh, you know that makes things even easier if it boots directly into your you know your first language. Yeah, I would assume if you did do that and they when they start Orca, it would just automatically, you know, speak in that language. Orca, I think it must almost work in every language that Ubuntu does offer. When you go through the setup, there's like literally, I don't know, 25 to 30 languages you can choose. Oh, within Orca? So Orca has its own language setting separate from whatever you've got the desktop set to? Well, when you set it up, it, like the first question, I remember the first question asked because I just do a bite on, on autopilot now, but <laughs> there's a section when it asks, like, what language do you want? And it starts going through, like, you know, one, English, UK, two, English, US, and then three, German, four, French. And it goes through, like, a whole bunch of, like I said, 25 to 30 languages. It does, like, Vietnamese and Mandarin and, and Greek and all kinds of languages. Awesome. Cool. So if anybody's got any other questions, um, can they bug you on Identica? Yeah, I'm Frostbite on Identica. If you go to Identica uh, slash Frostbite, they'll find me. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. That was really interesting. And we'll oh, hopefully... Thanks, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. 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 And now it's time for the news. A tablet version of Firefox has been released for Android 3.0 Honeycomb. The new version features the signature Awesome Bar and adjusts the UI depending on the device's orientation to make the best use of space. Welcome to about two years ago, probably. Awesome. Really? 
Um, I'm confused by this. Yeah. Tablet, I mean, everybody uses Chrome or whatever. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yet another mobile web browser. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Google has axed a number of projects to concentrate resources on higher impact products. Projects given the boot include Google Desktop and Google Pack, showing a tightening focus on browser-based offerings. There is a very good line on the Google Pack website saying that the popularity of downloaded software is declining. <laughs> really? Yes. yes. Please use Gmail. Please use Gmail. <laughs> it's declined even further now, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, it's funny. The, the Google Desktop and Google Pack, I only ever see on other people's computers that I end up having to fix for some reason. I see their toolbars and stuff. I don't think I've ever seen either. No. Yeah, uh, 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 a guide to running. <laughs> <laughs> you finished that quicker than I was expecting. A guide to running on live, the cloud based gaming platform on Wine, has been published. The service uses the online servers to run the games and stream the display to the client, giving the potential to bring modern high end games to Linux. Yeah. Pretty cool. I mean, technically, they're not running on Linux isn't this, in any way, shape, or form. Isn't this the equivalent of running them on a Windows box and VNZing in? Pretty much. Right. But, well, it kind of. But what they do is, I think they stream. Uh, they encode whatever's coming out of the game, the the, what, the screen, as a movie, effectively, and they stream the video. So all your PC is doing right. is playing HD a video, HD yeah. video, yeah. and you're sending the keyboard Key events and, and mouse right. events back the other way. And it, when you look at the video, it actually looks really impressive. A game like Batman Arkham Asylum, which isn't available on Linux... And they're playing it on an Ubuntu desktop. Okay, it's using a third-party proprietary service, but then it's a proprietary game, so, you know. Yeah. Double, all your, double freedom hating. <laughs> all your games are belong to us. Yes. A freedom of information request into the public sector IT spending has shown that the government departments continued to spend large amounts of money on proprietary software, despite previous promises to create a level playing field for open source. Fancy that. <laughs> yeah, I think the freedom of information request was made by the BBC. Yes, mm. it was. Yes. Well done. No BBC. one seems surprised mm. by this. Nobody no. is very no. surprised. No. Even the uh, one of the things was they were trying to do a, I don't know if it was one department or the whole government was trying to build a database of all the uh, software assets they had and they put out to tender to, do, to invited to open source companies in. Was it so, an access database? For <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't, but they invited all these companies to tender for it. Uh, they had about a week to prepare it. They came to this meeting and then somebody who didn't come to the meeting got the contract anyway. And they were proprietary software. And they were proprietary, yeah. I think, yeah. So, hey ho. Mm. Mm. So, Cliff Richard's winter fuel rarries have been relieved by a European extension of copyright for music recordings to 70 years. Yeah, all that campaigning worked really well, didn't it? When yeah. we got we got the thing thrown out a couple of years ago, it sort of snuck yes. through the back door without a vote in the Parliament. Mm. And now, because apparently, Cliff Richard is on the poverty line and needs the money for this recordings for some work that he did yeah. 30 or 40 years ago. That's yeah. right. Everybody else has to save for their pension while they're working. Yes. But not musicians. No, no, no. These creative types, they're allowed to get paid over and over and over again for years not after even, they did the work. Not even necessarily creative types. Not, yeah. Not what, even a good session songs. musician, you know, or someone. <laughs> yeah. Like My mum would like it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, me. Uh, several servers owned by Linux Foundation, including kernel.org, have been compromised. The foundation ha has advised all users to change passwords and SSH keys while the servers affected are being rebuilt. Okay, so these are quite big compromises, aren't they? They've been offline for several days. Yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah, it's affected a few websites, and I don't think they've fully released the details of what's happened yet. Okay. Well, we have to wait and see how long it takes to come back online. They don't think any of the kernel source code or whatever has been affected, and mm. uh, it's now available via GitHub. So people yeah, can yeah, Linus <laughs> posted an announcement, you know, in the, the fact that everything is open and I can use other services, so he did. <laughs> put, the, <laughs> put the code up somewhere else. <laughs> Edit Share have revealed further details of plans for their professional video editing suite, Lightworks, which they plan to release their Linux this year and open source in 2012. Yeah, some quite famous films have been um, made using Lightworks. The King's Speech, I think, was one yeah. of the ones recently. I mean, it's a professional video editing application, and although it's not open source, the pricing Yet. looks like it's going to be reasonable for support if you, uh, you know, actually want to pay for commercial support. It's not going right. to be very expensive. Yeah, I mean, there's been some complaints that you know they're taking a long time over this. They're kind of dragging it out a bit, and even at the end of the day, the open source bit 
won't actually get you very far because you still need all the codex, which yeah. you will have to pay for or pay a license fee for. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, that's the way of the world. And, you know. It's, it'll be interesting to have. And I'm interested to look forward to uh, giving it a go when it's open source. Mm. Ben Goldacre has launched Nerdy Day Trips, a website for crowdsourcing geeky points of interest around the world that might be good for a visit. Ooh. Are there any around here? Uh, there's yeah, there's one on the Isle of Wight, which is the disused rocket base. Where oh, oh, yeah, we've been there. War, yeah. wow. and there's a few things um, sort of around the New Forest and things as well. Yeah, I was quite impressed mm. that I was looking around near home and the first thing I clicked was the bubble factory in Ozzle Twistle in Accrington. It's like, it's oh, on the map! <laughs> by home you mean the north. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry, can you say those words again? <laughs> the, 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 bubble, the what in where? The bubble, the factory, the bubble factory, factory. In Ozzle Twistle. <laughs> That's a real place. Real place. I, don't, I don't really care what it is. I just it's, wanted you to say it again. It's a real place with a word, a name long enough that it has to have an apostrophe on the road signs. Oh, bless. <laughs> yeah. And that's all of the news. And we have some events. Uh, the Ubuntu UK Happy Hour is happening around the UK. <laughs> this is Alan Bell's great plan to uh, basically get drunk in as many pubs as possible, I think. Yes. Yeah, I think, it, well, there's a few reasons for it. One was to make sure that um, people all around the country can get involved, because a lot of the events are always in the in the London and South East area. Um, and um, the plan is to people to nominate a pub uh, or venue and um, choose a time and a date, and people go there on that particular date for an hour or more. <laughs> Um, and it sounds like fun. Yeah, it does go to a pub. Really I can't see anything wrong with that. And Alan Bell buys all the drinks. I seem to remember. Yes, that's what I heard he was saying. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he said something along those lines. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Seventeenth of September. It's Software Freedom Day. Hang on, that's soon, isn't it? That's that's, that's this Saturday. This Saturday, Saturday is Software Freedom Day, and uh, Hereford and the All Saints Cafe from ten a.m. to four p.m. Uh, and there are other events all around the world. Apparently, yeah join in with those similarly bar camp blackpool is on the 15th of october they've done a second release of tickets there are still about 12 left so you stand a chance of getting one now um but they are also need projectors and screens so if you're able to provide any of those you're going along to a bar camp blackpool get in touch with them and there's a libra office conference on the 13th to the 15th of october in paris sounds rather good yeah especially if you like libra <laughs> <laughs> well uh, and or Boston. Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it crashed on me a lot in the week. Oh dear. Ooh. Go and complain. Mm. And the FOSDEM dates have been announced. It's oh. happening on the 4th and 5th of February 2012. Are you going to go this year? Maybe. Or next year? Maybe. Well, <laughs> this time. Yeah. Maybe. You think yeah, you're going to Yeah, I've yeah. missed four years. It's just the beer you miss, really. Well, yeah, no, and the. The companionship with my podcasting buddies. Yeah, we can no. do that here. It's a lot cheaper to <laughs> uh, go yeah. for a curry in Southampton than it is to go for a curry in Belgium. True. But yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe go this year. Mm. Cool. And that's the end of the events. Right, it's now time for the bit about Ubuntu. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the... Uh, two-year terms of five out of six of the Ubuntu technical board members, which are finishing at the end of the month. So there's an election process going on. Tell yes. us about that. Uh, well, you've pretty much explained it. <laughs> <laughs> What's so the technical the, board do? The technical board um, make decisions on the technical direction of Ubuntu, like uh, they choose programs uh, that, that are included on the CD, maybe, or help um, direct the project in a technical manner, as opposed compared to the like community council, which do community-level stuff. The technical board might, you know, decide, for example, on whether to go and synchronise with Debian Stable or testing or unstable or whatever. And um, yeah, there's a few members who are expiring on their on that team. So people like um, Scott James Remnant, uh, Colin Watson, Colin Watson, uh, Case Cook. Um, I think Mark Shuttleworth is always on the technical board. He's yes. uh, got a special place. Well, it's his ball, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> his sh- magic box of shiny coins. Yeah. Um, yes. So there's a, a nomination period that runs up till today, in fact. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it ran till three that. o'clock this afternoon. So hopefully, if you're a Ubuntu developer, you'll get the chance to actually vote in that soon. Yes. Good uh, luck. Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I'm, I think, I'm not sure I know the process for that. Actually. I think Ubuntu developers are allowed to vote on the technical board. Oh, okay. As far as I understand it. 
not normal Ubuntu members like, like me. Like you <laughs> and me. I'm just a pleb. <laughs> yeah. Um, and after our interview with Matt Ravel on the last show, Canonical are going to hire a usability and communication specialist for Launchpad. Not as a direct. I was going to say because yeah. our interview was so great. Um, Matt, or so bad. Oh, so bad. <laughs> they need yeah. a new communication <laughs> specialist. Uh, Matt mentioned they were looking to hire this role, and now it's available for review online. And notice they've got a software engineer up for grabs as well. Not literally. Uh, okay. you know, <laughs> a job. I could use Where do I sign up? <laughs> Is it Graham Bins? Can we grab him? <laughs> And uh, John O'Bacon has blogged responding to criticism of the new menus in 11.10. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, he basically wrote a blog post saying, hey, look, the menus that disappear and then appear when you put your mouse near them, and they look great. And um, lots of people kind of disagreed with him. Uh, yeah. So he pointed out that if you open every toolbar in Word, it looks really bad. Yes. And <laughs> so I think that sort of took it to an extreme, but yeah. It does, but that's Word, I think Word 2003 he's got the screenshot from. Word has mm. changed its UI for the ribbon interface to kind of enhance the discoverability of its menu items. Mm. The idea you can flick around a lot more quickly between those menus. But uh, it's also that time of the year where... Sorry, Alan. No, no, go on. I was going to say, it's also that time of the year where John O pimps it's his birthday coming up and ask people to buy him presents is it yeah so watch out for that i'm sure that'll be in a blog post near you soon this blog post isn't going to get him anything. no it's not it really isn't <laughs> it's it, it, i found it an interesting read and it's you know it's as he says at the top he's not a usability person um it's just one guy's opinion about how he thinks that the new way the menus work in ubuntu 11 10 is quite good I personally don't agree with him, and I th I don't particularly like the idea of having menus that are hidden by default. Um, but uh, you know, I'm willing to try it. It's all about the balance between efficient screen real estate use mm -hmm. and the discoverability of having things on the screen so people can see them and easily know to click on them. And yeah, find out what happens. Yeah, depends if your screen's that small that you can't give up space to the menus, I suppose. And I don't think that's the case with any of the computers I use. Well, it's not just the, the fact that you're giving up space and there's, you know, space you might want to use for, you know, it's one extra or two extra lines in a terminal or, you know, one extra line of text in a browser. It's something sat on the screen that doesn't need to be there for the most of the time, mm, for yeah. most people, is a waste of space. I suppose so. And that's the whole direction with Unity anyway, isn't it? Hide everything until you... Until you need it. Until need you it. throw your mouse towards the thing you need and yeah. then it appears. But I, I, I agree with the people who've made comments that say um the one of the problems with it is you can't go straight for um a particular menu item like mm. you know no, where, the, where the menu is you know file edit view history bookmarks if i want to go to the bookmarks menu i can find my mouse straight at bookmarks whereas what most people find with a hidden menu is they throw their mouse somewhere near the corner and then have to track horizontally right. to get to the one they actually want and that's not efficient i guess the slightly annoying thing is that what gets put there in place of the menus is the name of the application you've currently yeah. got open now, yeah, the title bar or something. yeah sometimes it's the file name but i don't think it always is so it seems like not very much to replace the menus with but. yeah i mean it's determined by the application as to what they put in yeah. their title bar isn't it like internet explorer sponsored by <laughs> the internet you know and Scott James Remnant has written a lengthy proposal for the new Ubuntu release process. Yes, it's good. <laughs> it's very it's long. Really, well, I think it, I understand it. It's but, kind of not surprising given he now works for Google on Chrome that have a development cycle that looks very much like the one he proposes. Yeah, he certainly identifies some of the things that I have thought are problematic with the Ubuntu release cycle as it stands at the moment, the six-month release cycle effectively only giving about 13 weeks' work um, for developers who are full-time on the project once you take the freezes and, and the, the merges and tests and all this other thing into account and two weeks to recover from UDS, apparently. Um, <laughs> you only get that sort of a short period of time. It's not a very efficient release process. Um, so I can totally identify with the uh, the reasons he's, he's put his proposal forward. Um, and there is a counter-proposal from, uh, I think, George Castro. I might be wrong in that. No, name, George, M MPT was it. MPT was it, okay. He basically said he should go the other way and only do two-year re two releases which is almost the Debian model of releases, mm. kind of. They try to, they aim for that, uh, at least. So, <laughs> Scott James Remnant is proposing a monthly 
yeah release of a monthly, monthly release it's almost so, a sort of rolling release yeah but you could you yeah. can choose which you subscribe to as a user you could say i only want the two-year one and i'll you know i'll stick on that yeah or you could say well i want to keep the monthlies mm. and you'll get new packages you know quite regular, quite regularly yeah. um or you could go further and say i want to be on the beta cycle or the alphas and get get stuff get daily or week, yeah, get a that, weekly update. that is a lot like debian isn't it it is yeah, yeah. Yeah, fancy that. Yeah. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons I moved to Ubuntu was the fact that I didn't like having to run Debian Unstable to get the latest yeah, stuff and it breaking absolutely. a lot all the time. Yeah, me too, actually, yeah. And that's so, all. So six months is quite a nice no, compromise, not. really. And, and now, now that's, that's all. all in the bit about Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> And Jay Far- uh, it's time for the feedback. <laughs> Come on, tighten up, everyone. <laughs> okay, so Jeff Forrest well emailed us about his new Linux news podcast. And we're going to put a, n- a link in the show notes in case you're, in- in case you're interested in taking a listen. Um, and it's a twice-weekly podcast that... Aims to be accurate by making sure we have the facts straight. We only use reliable and respected sources. And when we report rumour, we make that clear. And aims to be fair and not state personal opinion. So you see, we don't oh. feel at all threatened by this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we rarely have our facts straight. And we certainly state personal opinion. So Absolutely. if you want something to contrast with us, you know, you go listen to that. Yeah, I presume they're not just getting their stories from the register or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Who would do that? Uh, not that, not that we do, but you know, it would be a reason for it not to be very mm. accurate, if you know what I mean. Right, and um, finally, the Wing Commander has sent us a message from his travels. Hello? 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 Oh, bugger. Hello? Ah, that's better. Wing Commander, Sir Arthur Curmudgeon, back on the line, speaking to you wirelessly from my very own loco. The Orient Express railway train, don't you know? Marvellous thing, these smartphones. Not quite my definition of smart. It's a bit plasticky for my taste. I've put a tweed cover on mine. Evidently, this thing runs a sort of Linux as well. So open source credentials tick, jocks away, and off we go. I'm taking a little trip, you see. We just turned left at France on the way to Istanbul. I've been telling my fellow passengers all about Agatha Christie, whose house I stayed at when I was a child. And they've been discussing the ideal train-based murder they'd like to commit. Apparently, they've all met some loud, obnoxious English tourist on the train and can't wait to get rid of him. I haven't seen him yet, so I'm hanging about the dining car where he's supposed to be loitering. Anyway, I'd better get on before we go into another tunnel. The point I wanted to make about your last program is... Oh dear. Just in case you're wondering, that word he said at the beginning was debugger. Yes. Right, (laughs) Right, okay, I'm not going to bleep that twice. So, yeah. Do you think that's it? Do you think it's the end of the Wing Commander? Or do you think we can get Poirot on the case? (laughs) I wonder whether we've heard the final message from him. Unless he starts leaving us messages from, from beyond, beyond the, the grave. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of the wing commander. <laughs> Ooh, that fair. sounds like an Iron Yeah, song. I'm sure there could be uh, some sound effects in there that we could get Creative Commons, I don't doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe he'll he'll uh, put in an appearance in, uh, in our Christmas episode. You never know. Ooh, oh, jingle jangle The ghost train. of yeah. wing commander's past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And that, rather surprisingly, is the end of your feedback. (laughs) 
And it's all for the episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers, Twitter feeds, Facebook, IRC, all that kind of stuff. Let us know what you think of the show and give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Join us on Tuesday the 27th of September for our next live episode. Yeah, awesome. I'd, really, I'd really like to receive some voicemail. We don't get much voicemail. No, we get, we get the odd random weird one from some bloke travelling on a train. But yeah. We, yeah. That may not happen uh, anymore. If yeah. you're listening, well, yeah. other than him. leave us a voicemail each. Yeah, phone us up. And we'll, play yeah, we'll fill the whole the show. show. Yeah, and then we can the just sit here eating cake. Yes. Anyway, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.